Joining me to discuss this historic result is Paul Kelly, historian, author and editor-at-large of the Australian newspaper. Paul, great to see you. The defeat of the voice, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, that the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, made an astonishing misjudgment, a misjudgment in two senses. First of all, he got the issue wrong. This was a very flawed proposal right from the start. Secondly, he misread the country. Uh, suburban and regional Australia rejected the proposal. And I think in that sense, we see the Prime Minister has misinterpreted the sentiment of large parts of middle Australia. He needs to reflect on that because this issue over the past 12 months has defined Anthony Albanese as a leader and the issue has brought him undone in terms of the fact that this has been an extraordinary defeat. And what he's got to do now is reflect on his leadership and attempt to recover. I, I'm going along with everything you've said, Paul, but here's the problem. I'd even forgive him if he had said, well, misjudgment, misread it, terribly sorry. You know, you think, well, very stupid, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is here, we are now being told, not by him that it's, that it's racism that causes this, but we are being told by him and others, misinformation is the result. Not, the, not one admission that the voice itself was the issue. This strikes me as dangerous, making worse the damage. Well, look, the point I'd make here, Andrew, is that I think what really happened is that Anthony Albanese felt that Australia uh, had changed in both a political and social sense. And when he reflected on the same-sex marriage plebiscite, his victory in the election last year, the Aston by-election, and then the victory of the Teals in the Liberal seats. I think he felt that all this constituted the passing of a phase of Australian history and that we'd entered a new phase, a new phase where things were going to be possible that were previously considered to be impossible. I think, I think that is the sort of approach that he had and it was reinforced by something I've seen many times and that is the... the the fact that you get a new and successful Prime Minister drunk on hubris. And I think you put those two things together and I think they're very important in explaining what went wrong. Um, and, of course, the difficulty that he's now facing, of course, is that he's got to reconstruct Indigenous policy and he's also got to repair his own leadership. Well, repairing, uh, doing something about Indigenous policy, I find... That's going to be incredible because before the vote, he and Linda Burney, the Indigenous Australians Minister, were both saying uh, we need the voice because otherwise you're just voting for more failure, more of the same. Now they're going to have to tell us, oh, no, they, they can have answers without a voice. That strikes me as a very hard sell because it's going to make them look like liars before the voice. Well, I think that's right. And the other point to make here is what uh, Senator Price is saying. What she's been saying is that there's got to be a fundamental change now in Indigenous policy. And if the government is not prepared to make that change, then she's prepared to make this an issue at the next election. This has been an enormously important statement she made, which was on page one of The Australian Today. And I think what we're now going to see is we're now going to see both Anthony Albanese and Peter Dutton attempting to feel their way towards a new pathway when it comes to Indigenous policy. But I think while the community would like to see a bipartisanship between them, I think that could be quite difficult. And I think the warning that Senator Price gave is enormously significant. This could continue to be a significant political difference between the government and the coalition. I think the opposition make a very big mistake if it went bipartisan on this, because this is one issue where you need a debate and a fundamental realignment of what Aboriginal policy is, and I don't think Labor Party is capable of it. But for the political fallout for the government, Paul, what struck me is how inner urban seats voted yes, while people on the outer, and I mean outer geographically as well as politically on the outer, they voted no. And it strikes me that this is exactly the same divide that you see on other issues like global warming policies, inner urban seats, very for Labor's policies, battlers, farmers, people in the Hunter Valley, for instance, very much against. 
I reckon there's a possibility if the Liberals could now paint Labor as the party of the insiders of the elites and the Liberals as the party of the outsiders, that could turn out to be quite potent, particularly with Labor led now by a man whose judgment uh, is betrayed, is, is, is exposed, is fundamentally flawed. Well, if I was Peter Dutton now, Andrew, I'd be thinking about making a major speech sometime over the next several weeks. A speech saying that the Liberal Party and the Coalition stands for the values of middle Australia. I think Dutton's been uh, depicted, uh, quite rightly in many senses, as a negative politician. But he's really got a chance now to open up a more positive vision for the country. I think the problem that the uh, Labor Party, the, the problem that Anthony Albanese faces now is he looks like he's the champion of the established political order. That is, the corporates, the trade unions, the professional classes. <laughs> but the difficulty with that when it came to this particular issue is that was, um, that, that was a minority of the country. Uh, and the really significant issue here is that that power structure didn't prevail. I think this creates an opportunity here for Peter Dutton to talk about values, to talk about the economic foundations of the middle class. If you'd like to go back to Menzies, when Menzies talked about the forgotten people, Correct. of course, Menzies wasn't talking about the forgotten people being the party of the business community or the party of the trade unions. He was making a pitch to the ordinary Australian people, working class and middle class, who felt they were voiceless who felt they were being overlooked, who felt the elites weren't looking after them. So I think if Peter Dutton could manage to conceptualise this with some practical policy examples, then he's got an opening. Now, whether he's capable as a leader of doing that or not, I'm not certain. I just think as a former copper, that suits him far better than trying to win back the teal seats, which he must probably try to do, but I think don't warp the party trying to do that. Stick to exactly what you just said. Be the party of the outsiders, the forgotten, uh, the people who aren't getting listened to. Paul Kelly, thank you so much indeed for your time.